Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is antiques expert Francesca Posati and actress Helen Cardona. Collector, hotelier Francesca Bortolato, Bortolato Posati spent her childhood in Venice at the Bauer Hotel, which was owned by her grandfather. Her grandfather was Arnoldo Benatti, a successful yes. shipbuilder. And Francesca uh, was an English major in the U.S. and spent most of the 80s in the U.S. So how could you leave Italy and then uh, spend your time here? Well, uh, you know, Italy and the U.S. are now part of my uh, <laughs> mostly impossible uh, body, you know, and it's uh, one body, two souls in this sense. I was having a hard time with those names, but <laughs> I know those names. <laughs> Bartolotto. Bartolotto, yeah. Well, this is kind of a hard name. That's why Posadi is much easier. It's much way. easier. But your, your grandfather was Ligurian? Yes. What he, is that? Uh, Ligurian, Genova is the other. Uh, a city on the other side of, of Italy, which the, in the Mediterranean. And at some point, he moved to Venice. He met my grandmother, who was a real Venetian. He fell in love. He moved all his business there. And uh, starting, uh, you know, uh, all uh, an entrepreneur kind of um, work during the 60s uh, and 50s. And um, that's where he left all his life after And that. then he bought the hotel? He bought the hotel way at the beginning when he moved in the 30s. Uh, and that's, uh, the hotel was uh, owned by Mr. Bauer, who was another big entrepreneur of uh, Venice. Oh, he lived for in Venice too, Mr. Yes, Bauer? Yes. And I, uh, the first time I stayed there was in the 50s, and it yeah. was the Bauer Grunwald. Because my grandfather decided to leave the last name of, uh, of the hotel, as it was. It was uh, Mr. Grunwald. Yeah, then. Mr. Grunwald was his uh, son who married Mr. Bauer's daughter. So there was this joining last name that kept on the fame of the Bauer before him. And it went on for so many years. I mean, your grandmother is a Venetian. Yes. And then you were born there. I was born and, and raised, and my children, actually, they were born in America, but now my daughter lives in Venice since she was two years old. And uh, she likes to be called Venetian. She does way. like that. Yes. And where did you come to get your degree? Well, I had my degree in Venice uh, at oh. the University of <coughs> Kafoskari. Then I moved right after to America, where I lived for 11 11 years, as you said, and uh, doing some other kind of courses, but mainly following my husband's uh, business around the state. Oh, that's why you were here. You were in Texas? Yes, I was in Michigan, Texas, and New York City at the end of it. I see. So um, you come back and forth to New York all the time, but I don't think you come to Los Angeles. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm missing it. I wish I could do it more often. Sometimes, you know, you, you feel that that uh, out of little time that you have at your disposal, three days for LA, it's not enough. No. When you went back to Venice in 1997, did you intend to take over the Bauer Hotel and make well, it your no, own? No, it was, no, I, I don't think I, I, I had any idea what was going to happen in my life then. Uh, it was kind of a coincidence that uh, ultimately uh, led to this conclusion. Uh, after a few years that I moved back to Venice, uh, the situation with my family kind of got to uh, uh, a stop. Uh, my mother passed away and my father passed away pretty much at the same oh. time. So I, I, I found myself with a situation where I had to take a decision. Either I do, did invest all my energies and not only energies into trying to bring back all the, the companies and estates into the previous splendor, 
or just sell everything as most of uh, people does. At were some you point. alone? Were you the only yes, child? Yes, oh, yes. you were. So that was the. Then you took on this huge. I think when your grandfather bought it, he refurbished it. Yes. And when you took it on, you took on a well, huge refurbishing. Well, I operation. had to do it because it was over 50 years that no one has oh, done it anything. Was. You know, because neither my mother or my father did got involved into the hotel business oh. at all <laughs> and uh, therefore things went on by inertia for many many decades uh, since he passed away. Well as you started to refurbish I think you had you probably had a lot of antiques in the yeah. hotel and yeah. you had to buy a lot of antiques. Exactly. And this book by Barbara Orbach, A Passion for Antiques, uh, features you in one of the, I'm going to open this up. Well, this is actually in one of my, in, in my house, as, because I have a passion for antique, which I brought since my childhood. My father was an antique collector, my grandfather was an antique collector, and, uh, and the, ultimately I, I just gather all the, the best pieces they had, all the things we were mostly bond and affectionate and put it into my residence in Venice at one point. But then you had to use a lot of them, you used a lot of them in the hotel as well, In the right? hotel there was incredible huge uh, uh, storage of antiques. Oh, we I were bet. left uh, kind of abandoned and required uh, a lot of uh, restoration in some cases and now I'm extremely proud because some of the pieces are really unique and I find uh, antique dealer that I occasionally meet and they know about some of the pieces better than I do oh, and right? uh, it happens about a month ago I had the call from someone said I know there was a piece of this or that at the hotel would you be willing to sell I said I'm not selling anything <laughs> because it took me so long to put it all together but it's it's a very uh, interesting historic uh, um, pass through antiques because it goes from different centuries are they in the ho are they in the con Common places, or they're in the ho in the rooms. Well, they are either in the common places and then in the room. I I trust that the room should have antiques and not something. only copies. Um, there was an addition put yeah. on, which I absolutely love walking into because it's all Venetian glass. I right. mean, torchiers that yes. line the yes. whole. Uh, what is it? A big. End it's a, like a ballroom. A ballroom, yes. yeah. Where they have those columns <laughs> made out of uh, glass, oh, which are so all beautiful. hand blown. They're they're quite spectacular. Well, that was there before you got there. Well, n not ne not really. What happened is I had in mind to make those columns mm. of lights. So mm. I went back to the old designs uh, of oh. uh, of the Bowers glass and chandeliers and uh, um, fixture, and I had them from the same blower, remake the same designs in order to make those columns. Those and are incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm amazed how, how he could reproduce exactly the same thing with the but, same technique. But so many things in the hotel and you took over a palazzo next door. Well, Everything was it, uh, was um, was already there since beginning. You know, the the was bower all part was, of it? was all part. The different oh, building, a corp to one to the other through the different uh, decades, I see. and um, it was all called the bower. But actually, palazzo was always there. I, I only see. gave it more more personality to it I and see. divided from the rest of the hotel. One of the other things uh, when we were talking, you said you took over the. The vineyard, the yes, winery yeah, in yeah. Uh, Friuli, Friuli. Friuli, which is a section uh, that I didn't know about. Tell us about that area. Well, um, again, my grandfather at some point, he, <coughs> he felt that he liked it to, to be next to the countryside. And uh, so he m invested in the um, in to the dairy farm and the winery in the Collio. How far is that from it's Venice? It's about um, 90 kilometers, mm. so it's about an hour drive. So you can which go there fantastic. during the day and come you back? Do, yeah, well, that's <laughs> what I do. <laughs> but it's always nice to spend weekends because uh, the region is really mm, beautiful. Uh, it's blooming uh, uh, now more than ever into a very high quality wine making region and uh, with great 
uh, food and a great really? quality of life, yes. Um, do you make your own wine there? I make my own wine and I'm quite proud because that company was born out of a family need, so without a big commercial uh, ob objective or project and now is uh, becoming a uh, worldwide uh, sold so company, now, yeah. yes, and I even brought it to United States uh, about uh, six months ago, That's so I'm so great. very happy well, it's, about it. It's so great, and then to know that you're a long generation of Venetian, and you belong to a group called Save Venice. Well, Save Venice, <laughs> yes. Because well, that's important, isn't it? It is very important, and uh, I'm very grateful to, to all the uh, non-profit uh, organization who are working. So it's American, right? This is American, mm -hmm. and uh, this has been working for over 40 years uh, for the safeguard of Venice, and I am very honored to be part of it and uh, we are doing a great job and uh, every year uh, it becomes more and more effective. I remember when we were in Venice a couple of years ago, we went out, we found some little square and went for dinner and there you were and we thought, oh my gosh, this has to be one of the best places in Venice or Francesca wouldn't be there. <laughs> Well, there are so many beautiful little places, <laughs> and uh, there are not that many. So once you meet me there, <laughs> it's it right? is, uh, as, as you can imagine, you know, having an hotel where uh, I'm s so well served that I, I care know. of, it's hard to, to leave it to go outside. But um, I remember that. That's night. why we were so excited yeah. to see you outside yeah. of the hotel. Yeah. It's so um, beautiful. One of the things um, that to me makes Venice not very exciting is being overrun with tourists. I mean that's good for your business but for the say Venice people. No, and you, uh, let's not uh, confuse when the city is as you call overrun uh -huh. by, by tourists. tourists. Is, I don't want to call the word tourist is uh, day trippers, which is different. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because uh, um, the tourist is people that actually has a place to sleep, so they they have a room in the, into the space of the city, which will not never become a situation where you can walk into the streets because the the city of Venice is so small. And if you think that all those rooms were leave by inhabitants, you know, maybe uh, 50 or 80 years ago the streets were not so overcrowded. So this is a situation of people that come in for the day mostly than just uh, sleeping or, or staying so over for a, a couple of days. So that's the it's wrong, wrong way, way to talk way about, to about, talk it, about or it. Or to look yeah. at it. Well, that's good because I think being a native Venetian, you probably bristle at that kind well, of thing. Well, this is certainly something that uh, the new administration will have to look into it and try to, if, can we can't be prevented. I think Venice is a beautiful city and everybody should have the right to come and see it, but it sh should be only be controlled a little better. That's good. I'm glad. And I think you'll probably be on the board controlling it. You're doing well, so many things. <laughs> I hope so, if I <laughs> can give you. some suggestions. <laughs> thank you, Francesca, for being with us today. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And don't go away because we'll be right back with Helen Cardona. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Actor, poet, Hélène Cardona was born in Paris and raised all over Europe. She attended Hamilton College in New York and the Sorbonne in Paris to earn her master's. She, she earned a master's in American literature at the Sorbonne, which I thought was very strange. <laughs> Hélène is fluent in Greek because of her mother, in Spanish because of her father, and French because of the Sorbonne. But where did Italian and German come from? <laughs> well, I also, well, I was born in Paris, and then we moved to uh, Geneva right away. So oh, yeah. I, I lived in Switzerland for about 14 years and uh, picked up, started picking up some German there and Italian as well. Oh. And then, 
when, <laughs> when I moved back to Paris, um, I also studied at the Goethe Institute there, and they gave me oh. a scholarship, and I went to live in Germany also for a while. Is that right? So, so you became very fluent in German. Yes. I mean, in German culturally, too, then, yes. at the Goethe. Yeah. Yeah. Did you make any uh, films in Germany? No, no, I didn't at all. That was before uh, I studied literature, um, both uh, Spanish and English and German and uh, American mm -hmm. literature in, in Europe. And that was before I uh, came to the U.S. to pursue acting. Did you think you would come to the U.S.? Was that part of your plan? You know, there was no <laughs> plan. <laughs> it's really very <coughs> strange. I was, uh, I was a math major in high school, and I went straight into med school when I was 17. Oh, you did? I, I did. I it was not even as if I had options. It was kind of the thing exactly. to do, you know, and um, I thought, why not? And after two years of med school, I hated it and dropped out. And the idea came to me that, you know, acting was... Were you modeling? Were you doing anything in the limelight for your <laughs> beauty and for your... <laughs> you know what I was doing while I was going to school, while I was going to the Sorbonne? I was mostly teaching, and I started then working as an interpreter for the uh, Canadian Embassy. Oh. And I did a little bit of modeling here and there it's, uh, as well. But I just was from going to the theater all the time, you know, oh. we, we uh, had subscriptions to so many theaters and seeing the movies and growing up with, you know, um, movies... <laughs> but it takes more than that. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. All because I knew you have, you're so, you've done so many things and worked with so many great directors. There has to be, there had to be <laughs> hidden talent there yeah, somewhere. It, it was, it was definitely underneath, underneath. and uh, and uh, it's it's really it was so strong that after I had my masters, I just thought that's it. You know, I'm I'm leaving Europe behind, and I'm just pursuing my dream. And I I went to New York. I, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, oh. I graduated from there, went to the Actors Studio. Oh, you and, did? So you started and, taking classes in acting in America then? I started all over. In New York? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then were those the <laughs> things that opened the doors for you? It was just um, a new world, you know, and I loved it. I loved it so much. I didn't want to go back to Europe at all. And I, yeah, and then I got my green card. But did you get s stage plays? Were you yeah, in theater? Yeah, I did a lot of theater with the Actors Studio, oh, with a theater wondered. company called uh -huh. The Naked Angels, yes. with Ubu Theater Rep. Fabulous, um, and good places. Good places, <laughs> yeah. and a little TV. I did Law and & Order and a soap opera called Another World. Well, you didn't want to stay on the stage? I, it didn't pay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing paid unless you're on Broadway. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, I wanted to do film. <laughs> I love the medium, and I finally came to L.A. Well, yeah. did you start doing small parts in films? Because yeah. you worked uh, with great directors once I guess you started doing your small parts yes I, I, I was very fortunate to to meet uh, first um, uh, Lawrence Caston uh. uh, who hired me to to play Candy in Mumford and that was so magical oh. it was just uh, terrific I mean he's wonderful and you feel you, you'll do anything you know it's it just happens so that was just a lucky break it was yeah it was, well, you know you audition so much yes. that when something happens it feels like a lucky break because yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so many times you go in and you read and, and nothing happens we talk and about these lucky breaks <laughs> that take 10 years to happen right, right. yeah <laughs> but it and is but it sometimes a director just catches you Yes, and, yeah, and, and, and Lasse Hallstrom was the same. I mean, I met him twice. I first met him for um, the Cider House Rules, and I didn't get cast, and then he remembered me for uh -huh. Chocolat is what happened, and when I saw him again, he said to me, there's this part, you you know, you'd be great, Fafi drew the... You didn't the even audition that? I didn't audition for that one. I auditioned for Cider House Rules, but then for um, for Chocolat... For, for Chocolat, well, where was that role. made? Chocolat was made uh, in Europe. It was shot um, the village in France. It's a small village near Dijon. So beautiful. <laughs> it was so beautiful. Did you, did you never want to leave it there? Was, it was so quaint. <laughs> and then uh, the rest in, in, uh, in England, in, in uh, the West Country, uh, Bath and uh, London at Shepperton Studios. Oh, and so that was were, very nice too. You were there a lot. Well, was his direction a lot different from Kasdan's? Hallstrom, yeah. is he Hallstrom? Let's say Hallstrom, they're both very, very, um, um, they have a very loving energy and oh. they direct you in a very subtle way and, and they know what they want and maybe um, uh, Lauren, Lawrence Kasdan was a little b bit more specific. Uh, but Lasse, like, he lets you do it. He wants to see, you know, they both work a bit similar in, uh, that way. And, and, then, then, and then they fine-tune it, you know. Then what about Big Fish and the interpreter? Let's Big take those two, the, too. And the interpreter and, and also the terminal. Yeah, and those three. Those Let's were, take those. I, I was hired for the voice. 
you know oh so and like Darcel too the 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 part in uh in um <laughs> enough uh, michael apted's movie he i just oh, worked yeah. for him um in the recording studio and it was a voice role where i just recorded the part i was going to ask you if you did voiceover yeah voiceovers yeah. you did do you do that yeah, well yeah. so do they hire you as an actress if you're going to yes, be in a yeah, movie because yeah. voiceover is usually for radio or different they can be that too those are specific you know uh specific ADR work it's called where you're 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 just going to record oh. your voice and serendipity I did a song oh, I co-wrote it with a director Peter Chelsom and sang it <laughs> oh that was that's really yeah. interesting because I didn't so if somebody picks up the phone it's your voice on the other end in a film that was for uh yeah that was for enough that was my voice for that part of Darcel that you just hear her you don't see her yeah oh. yeah and well, these how are much fun time to do. do you put into it just that one that one was half an hour work the, that's the, the, it the, it was just great you just show up and you do a couple of takes <laughs> and and the song you know it really took two days but the actual recording took 15 minutes but then it does the director actually say okay Get her out here. We need Helene now for, for your voice out when you're on the phone. The director, I'm working with the director yeah. in the recording studio. So oh, I'm, I'm given oh. a time to show up there. I see. And so, <laughs> so you're not on the set. I'm not on the set. Oh, you're not on this the is, set. This is done separately, just in I the. See. Yeah, uh huh. You, you did. So since you've been out here, you worked a lot on TV. You worked ABC and NBC. Right. You're still yeah. doing that? Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what do you like better? Film? I think you like film. You I love film. About film. I mean, TV's great too. I have. I love film. It's a beautiful medium. Yeah. One of the things I think, talking about all of your. Oh, that was, yeah. Yeah, because all of the movies. What was this? was in Spain. This was for a Spanish newspaper. I did a, a couple of interviews uh, last year, and this picture was taken from the SAG Awards uh, here uh, for Chocolat, and this is the oh. picture they chose to, to print. But, yeah, this was a, a Spanish interview because uh, my father is from uh, Spain. Oh, so you were a child coming home. You were a great... <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah, I was very, very much embraced by uh, by them. Yeah, I one. love this. You gave this to uh, me, and it's all in Spanish. So I know. Couldn't read any of it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, along with all of this acting, I guess you have a little downside, a little downtime. Yes, a lot. <laughs> Do you? And you yeah. write poetry. Yes. I think this is so great. I'm going to hold these up. Tell us about which one was the first one. Um, the first was Chrysalis, Chrysalis, then came Dreamer's Song, and then the, the Night I'll Messenger. I'll this one next. Mm -hmm. so I've always written poetry since I was 12, and my father's a poet. Oh. And um, so this is a great uh, outlet for creativity, and I, j I just love it. I, yeah. Who did, I'm going to show Dreamer's Song because it's so beautiful, and then I'm going to show the back of Chrysalis because I love these illustrations. Yeah, they're beautiful. Um, Alexandra Eldridge is the artist, and she's a, a beautiful, beautiful artist, great friend of mine, and, and she's very generous with her art. She lets me use it. And um, she, so she didn't make this specifically for you? No. Uh, the, the, the sole piece that's on the cover uh, of Chrysalis, I actually bought from her. Uh, and, um, this piece? Yeah, this piece I have. And I, and I have um, the wings as well. The dreamer song I don't, I don't have. The wings. Now, is there yeah. something <laughs> about, uh, about wings in this? Uh, th th this this uh, little book is called The Night Messenger because it's basically uh, mostly inspired by dreams. Ah. A lot of my poems are uh, inspired by the dream world. Are they your dreams? My dreams. Do you jot them down and then I write, write them the down? Poetry? Yeah, yeah. I've, I love dream work and magic. <laughs> so they, they combine very well. Um, yeah. I always thought poetry was so difficult to write, um, to actually get the essence of what you're talking about. Yeah, it's heightened language and it's really. Um, meant to, you know, um, transcend. So it's... <laughs> the Night Messenger. Why don't you read us something from The Night Messenger? All right. Because um, that tells about your dream, right? Yeah, I'm going to read one. So that was uh, inspired by a dream I had in which the uh, Celtic goddess, which Seredwin, came to me and um, mixed with my mother. <laughs> so it's called My Mother Seredwin. The light on the icon, the way I see her in my dreams, 
the core of her at the edge of darkness, in a magic cauldron, always full, never exhausted, that brings her back to life, guarded by a golden serpent, coiled in the shape of an egg, the world snake marshalling inner reserves, the seed of a new journey, a glimpse of the mysterious and elusive, a woman in a wreath made of morning glories. This is how she lands on the page, slanted, looking out in space, integrated within me, save the blue sky across her face. A wreath of morning glories. Everything is so visual when you read it and when you write it. <laughs> yeah. I just could just see you with this wreath of morning glories around yeah, you. Yeah, it's beautiful images. It and, really um, is. And I also have a lot of animals that, when that you, come that When way. you write, and because you're so, so uh, fluent in so many languages, what do you think in? What language do you think in? Always the language I, I sp I'm speaking in. So um, oh, it's really? English when I'm here. If, when I fly back to Europe, I have a period of adjustment. I have one day where I'm still going to think in English, even though I'm in France. And then, you know, I, I, I really switch back to the language right away. Do you write in French as well? I mean, do you write um, in these other languages? I used to write in French. But English is my language of choice. Oh. So my thesis, let's say for my master's, I wrote oh. in English. Oh, I see. I, I chose, you know, I chose English or it chose me. I, I was drawn to it. Because it was so, easy for, and, and yeah. your images are so vivid that some, I, I was thinking when you were reading that someone who has the command of so many different languages, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint certain things right. in a language. But, you know, from an early age, I was, uh, like, we grew up, you know, at home, we spoke both French and Spanish. And then, you know, I started going to England very young. Oh, so and I you? went to Cambridge, too. And um, I don't know, the language grabbed me. You know, I just started loving reading in English just as much. As, yeah. as um, talking about all these languages, what about all the food? Do you cook in all these languages? <laughs> do you cook in all these languages? <laughs> yes, I do. I do you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I make, um, yeah, I make great paella. Yeah? I make so that's uh, Spanish. great yes Spanish great pasta Italian yes um, you know Greek um, they there's a lot of fish there and I love fish so that's so easy for you I love yeah I, but then you were in Germany for a long time Germany is you, the food is not the best thing about Germany but they have great breads you know dark breads oh so, <laughs> so we have it all right yeah and we had it all from you today thank you Helen. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for being with us, and thanks for reading your beautiful poetry. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017.